Good morning. It's nice to meet you. I'm Sean Dolly, the industry leader for health and life science. Thank you, Lori. Uh, it's great to be here. And uh, this is the most exciting uh, topic for my peers and I. Um, I gave a talk similar to this last week at the Health Information Management HIMSS conference out west. And uh, happy to be here. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, just quickly define what precision medicine is for us and for the broader population. Um, I wanted to talk about how big data is actually affecting the precision medicine movement. Um, wanted to talk about a couple of uh, use cases of customers of ours around precision medicine and some assets that we've built out in the space. Um, and then really end with some other kinds of use cases that might not be considered um, traditional precision medicine, but help drive us there and uh, synergistically are helped by um, advances in, in precision medicine. Just um, by way of background, in my role, I work primarily with physician executives and computational biologists. So I have a luxury of spending a lot of time on human health and advising uh, companies in the space um, and being a collaborator um, with scientists and physicians on how we can change things in the clinic, which is um, probably the most rewarding part of, um, of what I do. So what is uh, precision medicine? The first three, three slides are from the US NIH um, and you can read these. I won't read these. Um, What's most interesting, and I've been involved on and off with healthcare since the 90s. I've been involved with analytics and software since the 90s. And since 2008, have been involved in, um, in genomics and research, um, as well as time with, um, with healthcare uh, providers at the clinic. Um, what, is, what is different here and what is new is we have always had um, clinical information about patients. And if you look at the, the end of the first sentence, genes, environment, lifestyle, we've had reports of lifestyle. When my parents and grandparents went to the clinic, someone would take a history and they'd say, are you a smoker, are you this, are you that? Um, and we've had environmental data for some period of time. What is primarily new here is the prevalence and the presence of genomic information. And I think the highlighted portion of moving, uh, of moving this information to the clinic in some impactful way is something that I work on every, every single week. Um, and you'll see that in some of the slides. So why now on precision medicine? Um, in 2008, when I started getting involved in technologies around uh, gene sequencing, we were trying to figure out how to take information from a sequencer and align and assemble that information to actually put it together and make it clean and accurate about a person. And that took some period of time. Uh, it really did. And it is only now that we're getting to a place, and maybe one or two years ago, that we're at a place where a researcher can look at information about a patient and say, yes, it's not hard for me to get this information, get it cleansed, get it prepped, get it ready, and, and have some faith in, in the results. At the same time, through that eight years of time, since next generation sequencing became sort of a standard, um, we've been working on technology surrounding every part of those pipelines. And so the tools and the code, there's libraries and galaxies of, of ways to approach, and there's also annotation data sets. Um, and then there's big data, which is on the right, and that's, and that's why we're here. That's why we invest in the space. And you heard our chairman, Mike Olson, this morning um, talking with DJ about investments in precision medicine, is that we're really here. Um, and the data sets are, are of a size uh, that make this very difficult to perform with, without big data technologies. Um, you've probably heard of the million patient cohort. We're following in the footsteps of our friends um, across the pond who have Genomics England and their 100,000 uh, patient cohort that they're well on their way to. We have the Million Veterans Program well underway here in the US. Um, and again, we want to link 
The biobank, we want to link the lifestyle, which is the clinical record that we've always had, um, and we want to link the genome with electronic health records. And, and I would be remiss in not um, mentioning how important it is, this effort through meaningful use incentives to get health providers to say, we're going to create an electronic medical record. Th this has opened up just as much as genomic data innovation, our ability to merge those two data sets. And, it, and if there's any core level of understanding about what precision medicine is, it is at a patient level merging my genomic information with my electronic medical record, my genotype and my phenotype, putting those together, and then at a population level, being able to use that for research. And here's a, a final slide. It's an eye chart, it's not meant to be read, but just another definition of what this is all about. So I, I love this, uh, uh, someone a, a couple months back said an interesting statistic or story. They said, um, if we stopped right now and decided on the planet we were no longer going to make any more computers, everything that we have today is all that we ever will have. Uh, that in seven years, the growth of genomic information would fill every single device on the planet. So there's no more information for you because all your computers at home and at work will be filled with genomics. Um, this is, I had not uh, seen this slide, but it really puts it in perspective that in 2025, uh, we'll have annually 20 or 30 exabytes being created. And this is with the concept that we're gonna take your genomic information once. We're gonna sequence you once. Now the folks at Stanford in the IPOP group, or the folks who are working on IPOP would say, well does that mean I'm gonna, would I ever take your uh, blood sugar once? Let's say I do it when you're 14, I'm gonna take your blood sugar, and that's your record for the rest of your life. We don't, we don't have the resources to ever test it again, so that's your number. This is crazy. You know, they'll say, we should be taking it once a month, we should take your whole exome, because we know that events in the, in the world can, can uh, through a, a biological process called methylation, turn off certain genes. So if that's the case, uh, shouldn't we be watching changes in the genome? Um, and so realistically, that data size is actually an, a, a, a low estimate. So um, it, I don't know if you can see the gray, there's a faint gray downward uh, flat line that's, the, that's Moore's laws of decreased cost for compute as innovation occurs. The green line is colloquially known as Flatley's law. Flatley is the CEO of Illumina, the number one providers of gene sequencers. Um, it's amazing. It, there, there's no way that we ever in the mid 2000s thought that we'd be in a situation where we could realistically spend $1,000. We, we were in the range of what our um, health plans would pay for on a diagnostic odyssey for a patient. And the innovation that's happening in the space is, is robust. So it seems unlikely that 10 years from now we'll be doing gene sequencing in the way that we're doing today. So what is the effect of, of something like this? It's, um, it's massive. It's a massive effect. And it means that uh, using this data is plausible. It's not reserved for the ivory tower institutes or the rich. This data is now democratized. And uh, you know, I was, on, I was with a health system who was buying a gene sequencer and I was listening to the, the current lineup and they, there's a desktop gene sequencer that everyone in this room could afford. If you really needed a second job and decided you wanted to create your own lab, you could buy this and put it in, in the room if you wanted to get really sophisticated. Um, it's amazing. It's completely democratized. And as a result of that, in the mid-2000s, it was academics, it was research institutes, it was pharma that could do gene sequencing. I have tiny health systems, tiny hospitals peppered across the United States who say, our pathology group is getting a gene sequencer. 
And we're going to sequence folks. How are we going to handle that data? Now, the other thing that's exacerbating this phenomenon right now is that um, for me to get tenure, if I'm an aspiring professor, um, there's a few ways for me to do that. And one of the most signal powerful ways to do that is to get published in either science or nature, two uh, research journals. And some time back, it became obvious that the papers that Science and Nature were publishing were ones with very large cohort sizes. So my experimental design might be slightly weak, but if I had 40,000 uh, cases and controls, or sick people and healthy people in my study, that was, that was a lot. It was innovatively a lot, and I would get published. And so very quickly we had this, what the industry calls a race to N. Everyone is deeply hungry to increase the amount of size of genomics records that they can go do their experiments on. So this race to end, this deep hunger that says, there's money value here in my future career, aside from innovation, that's what you see on the right, is that upward slope. Together, that has a compound effect. So I want to I want to turn now that you you get a feel for just how vibrant this is, and and by the way, I feel like we're all in a great situation to be watching this right now. This is an absolute transformation. I will tell you that the students in medical school right now don't think about genomic medicine. To them, this is medicine. This is just a data set that they assume, you know, is always going to be there for them. And their frustration is, why can't I order? another whole exome next week? And why am I getting grief about um, the expense of this? Why don't I have a sequencer that I can control and I don't have to get in line uh, to use? It's, it's amazing. So this graphic came from a colleague of mine at Emory. He has a dual appointment at Emory Medical School and, and Children's Healthcare um, of Atlanta. And when I first saw this graphic, I was a little suspicious. It seemed kind of, I don't know, uh, lacking uh, detail. Um, but the more time I spent with them, the more I realized that the phenomenon they were experiencing was the presence of big data technology and the presence really of storage was bringing folks together from the research community at Emory with the clinicians um, at, on the hospital side. And, for, and, and I see this over and over that these two groups um, often aren't quite as collaborative as I thought and uh, what's coming out of the research bench in terms of knowledge is not being translated, is not translational to what's happening at the clinic. And what's bridging those folks is not pressure from above in the org chart. Um, it's not a share, it's not money, it's not a shared goal. Right now, what's happening in many of these places is big data is bringing them together. I don't know how to monetize that. I don't know if we should leverage that. It's just something, and I see it every day. We were gonna say, I got a phone call from one of the health systems, one of the IT guys, and he, he said, Sean, I used the three or four arguments and I explained big data to the, to the PhDs who were writing these studies. Um, it wasn't seemed to be working. Um, at the end of this, I told them that I had 200 terabytes of, of storage uh, that was available to them in, in my cloud era. He said, suddenly their eyes lit up. They were so interested. Um, you know, storage, I, I was at um, one of the groups at the NIH and we were sitting in a meeting there and they said, we have 270 terabytes of data that we use today and we went through the meeting and we talked about how we could help speed up their research. And uh, at the end of the meeting, we we're sort of getting our stuff ready. And as an afterthought, I said, by the way, if you had more than a capacity for more than 270 terabytes, are there data sets that you might add to that? And they said, oh, absolutely. We have well over a, 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 a petabyte of information. 270 is all we're allotted by IT. I, it was like talking to someone on a food ration, you know? For human health, I want them to have as much food as they need to, to produce results. Um, I, you know, it was, it was an eye-opener. And maybe this is the world that you all 
you all live in, but um, but if I'm a if I'm a merchant of if I'm a storage merchant, and I can use that in any way to enable folks to do more and better research, then I want to do that. So again, something that's really not uh, technical, but today in research we have data cores. One of the new NIH grants is for the data core, the data management capabilities and services to provide to the folks who are doing the Precision Medicine Initiative. And I've worked with a couple of folks who, um, including the Broad Institute is a customer of ours, who are submitting uh, for the data core. Um, I think research in the clinic through big data will have a new core. And that's what we're seeing. And folks come to me and they say, how do we make a case to the president of the hospital? How do we make a case to the director of research um, for a new core? I don't lack, we don't lack, you won't lack for physicians who will take this upstream. Uh, this is the easy part of what I do. And I don't generally worry about funding because everyone at the executive level is being asked by their peers, you know, what are you doing in precision medicine? And the answer is, we want to do something. The, so what, what's happening is specifically, and, and each of these areas are, are ones that Cloudera helps folks understand as a trusted partner, is that the folks at the clinic say, we now have genomic information for the first time. Who knows about this? Well, the research side knows about this. We're interested in their expertise, in their pipelines, in their skills, in their people. The folks on the research side are saying, you're telling me you have historical records and electronic health records on half a million patients going back five years and this is electronic? You're basically saying that if I can have access to your data set, I can get published in Science and, and Nature? The data and the storage, the expertise, the big data skills are, are bringing folks together. Um, I won't spend much time on this, but I like this as a diagram. Whatever health work you're doing, or your cousin, or your friend, your next door neighbor, could easily be plotted on this chart. We have folks, I talked to a physician, we were in the um, neonatal ICU, and he said, John, I, I get big data, but just so you know, I'm working with our bioengineering folks creating small uh, devices that get injected in the shoulder of one of my patients. I talked to someone at Battelle uh, two weeks ago, and they said, um, we're, you know, we might not be a good partner for Cloudera. We only have uh, five terabytes of data. Well, come to find out, they were testing neural circuits. They had a, some headgear and sensors, and they would put someone that wanted, that, that needed a prosthetic arm, they would put them in this device, and they would let them wear the prosthetic for an hour. You know why they limited that period of time to an hour? I, I hope you can guess. Because lack of storage. Because, because of compute. Not because of experimental design or the person got bored. Th this isn't right. We need to solve this problem. It's the same thing. It's like, well, why do you have five terabytes? Because we don't know how to be beyond five terabytes. And, and on the right-hand side, you know, we have huge relationships. Cerner runs 2,000 nodes of Cloudera and predicts sepsis in real time. And they don't do genomics. You know, that, you might not call that precision medicine. You might call that clinical prediction. Um, this is just an eye chart to, you know, the, as I said, the keys to precision medicine is a patient's genomic record um, merged with their clinical history. Um, you can build whole careers. You can save lives out of any single one of those boxes. Um, building a use case around them and we see that. So while precision medicine is the future of what medicine will be like for us and our children, um, we have lots of customers that do lots of different things. I wanted to mention just a couple other. I have um, pharma IT folks that I work with. Virtually every pharma has IT folks who say, our pharma's been here for 40 years, 80 years, 100 years. We have to be thinking about 10 years out and 15 years out. For us, that's sensible. And the data sizes at that, si at that time are going to be such that there will be data sets that are out in the world. And we can use uh, RDF and triples and an open web to federate certain queries and tools are being developed for this and the founders of the internet and Tim Berners-Lee are all sort of behind this. And we see it every day. So while I may not come to you and suggest, 
you want to federate your analytics on some in-house data warehouse that you have, I will say, and the NIH has been great, and, and there's huge amounts of open data, um, that we see this more and more. And they want to sit it on a, a, a HIPAA-compliant, secure Cloudera environment. Um, let me switch to technology a bit, or as close as, as I may come to technology. So um, if you're in the space, um, and let me take a show of hands. How many are PhDs here in the room? Okay. Man, the PhDs a lot mostly like to be up top. I think you need to go upstairs with your brothers. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, MDs and nurses? Okay, no MDs. Who considers themselves an IT professional? Oh, a lot of folks. That makes sense. Okay, so for the PhDs in the room and some of the IT folks, this might make sense on the left. That piece on the left is still being worked on getting that data from the wet lab into a sequencer and getting that data processed in what's called genotyped. Um, and, and, and there are some components of that that work with uh, Hadoop and work very well. 95% of the requests that we get, I would consider precision medicine requests, which are once that data is cleansed, how can I fit this into a system because I can't use a relational system. The data is unstructured and too large and not conducive. Um, and how do I merge it with all the databases that are out there on the web and available to me and the annotation uh, databases that enrich this information and that health record? Um, I wanna see if I have, okay. I'm gonna tell you a story and there's no slide for it here. So what, what is typical? What is typical is that a pharma, an ins, a research institute at a medical school, a health system, large or small, a government will come to us and they, they will say the following. And what's amazing is how consistent it is. I have EMC Isilon storage. I do that gray area. I do my upstream on a high performance compute environment which by the way, the analytic, not even analytics, the data processing for that upstream works very well in a high performance compute type environment. Um, I have one to five, and sometimes many, research groups that I support that are all separate, all have their own data and their own mission. Um, we've noodled around with relational approaches. It's not really scaling. But above all, I have an explosion of number of whole exomes, whole genomes, or even panels um, than I've ever had before. And HPC, to do the analytics that are involved in downstream, in tertiary, whatever you want to call it, in precision medicine, don't run on HPC. It's a different world. I was last week in San Francisco at the Tricon Molecular Conference, and there was a fellow who gave a presentation. He said uh, he was from the Joint Genome uh, Institute which is part of Lawrence Livermore, he said, we have a great supercomputer. We, we know high performance compute. And when we started to do our downstream analytics on this a few years ago, it was really, really slow. And we gave this a couple of interns and we said, can you guys work on this? Maybe we're doing something wrong. And they put together a little big data cluster that I think was four laptops or something and they said, um, they came back at the end of their summer and said, we think this problem is what they call embarrassingly parallel. And we've actually got it running a hundred times faster than on these little computers over here. This guy had, at the time, I don't think even knew what SQL was. And um, that opened a world for them, a, a different world. So um, what we said was, since everyone is saying the same thing, they want to mash together their clinical, their biological samples, and their genomics in an integrated biorepository. They have some storage. Hey, Cloudera runs natively on EMC Isilon. Um, every customer that we have is asking our services group to come in and build a variant store, a schema for this genotyped information and link it to the EHR. Why don't we just create a best practice and just give it away so that we can get these folks up and running? So there's a big data-esque open source uh, variant store at Cambridge University in the UK, 
we have our own variant store and, and eight accelerators that we give away to our customers to speed them up. There's innovation happening at, at Lidos, Lockheed, Martin, and um, I'm not up to speed on their solution, but we're excited that they selected Cloudera to develop that on. This is the reference architecture for Cloudera Omics. If you have questions, um, please email them to me and I'd be happy to talk to you more about what we've found works. We have a great company up in Rockville, Maryland called 5AM Solutions that have been doing genomics for over a decade. Um, who have said, the time is right for us to package our knowledge and rather than doing bespoke services, we're gonna create an application, we're gonna call it Sunrise, and we're gonna make it sit on Cloudera and Cloudera Omics. Um, I love their tagline uh, because that those four steps, that's what all of my bioinformatics folks do. They spend a good pe a bit of time curating data. I went into a biotech at one time and they said, um, I said, how many separate copies do you have of the 1,000 genome reference database? And they said, we'd rather not answer that as IT professionals because we would be embarrassed. And later I found out it was 19. Each scientist has their own, what I think of as an NT box under their desk with just enough curation of data to make it plausible to do their science. And as IT folks, I think folks get that it'd be better to have one centrally curated spot that we can all agree is sort of the best, the best thing. That's the transformation at one level that's happening in IT is we're saying we're going to bring this data together um, and there's value in that. So the curation piece is important. Um, exploring that data, 5AM takes a search approach. Our co-founder, Jeff Hammerbacher, who's been called Dr. Data by the New York Times, who's at Mount Sinai, takes the same approach. Um, there are folks that take a BI approach in a click or a Pentaho to do their cohort building and to do their exploration. So there's lots of way to, ways to cut this. Um, SaaS, huge communities of SaaS users. Um, and then you need to do your visualizations and that's another challenging piece because the visualizations involved in the space don't come out of the box in, in many of these tools. Um, but the net is there's starting to be innovation at the visualization layer um, on top of what we do. I want to just briefly touch on, and it, it looks like time-wise I'm doing okay. I want to touch on a few cases that we see at our customers. Bef and These are ancillary and supportive types of, of things that may be interesting to the federal government um, and the community that's here today. What I will say is um, for most of our use cases in precision medicine, the the use case that I don't document here but that I've been alluding to is that if I have a large number of cases and controls and I can see their nucleotide base pairs at every position on a genome or even just the ones that produce proteins in a whole exome and I can merge that with their outcomes as well as their clinical history, um, we can predict what's going to happen with that person. We can go in and figure out what are the genes. I work with folks that are working on um, FKBP5 at Seattle Children's. They work on, um, on FOXP3, um, specific genes that we know are rare variants that drive disease. That's a use case. These are folks who are going to publish and they're going to say, the most important gene of the billion you have is this specific gene. And we can know very early on that you're likely to have this problem. There are folks working on rare illness. At the Broad, we're going to be helping them with their matchmaker exchange program that says if I have a, a child with a rare disease, the most helpful thing for me is to see who else in the world has it. There may only be five or ten, but if I can find four of them, we can fix it. But we have to hit that, that threshold, that minimum, that floor. Once we do, we're there. As long as we sequence all those folks and we can get their um, health records put together, Thursday morning I'm meeting a PhD at uh, Mount Sinai who's putting chemicals in mice brains. Um, that comes out of understanding the genomes of the mice and understanding and using as a foundation the research that we've done to date. Those are the cases that I want to say are complemented by some of the things I'm going to talk about. So I have some blogs on Zika and I think a blog on Ebola that you can find. I'm not particularly proud of them because I mostly work with folks that 
are on the ground in these places and they're sometimes dealing with small data problems that I can't help. But from a signal detection perspective, I do think this is absolutely worth our time. I think we in big data have a role to play. Today, I don't think it's the most important role. And in my blog, I, I was up at the NIH when Ebola was happening, and I got an intro and sat with a fellow who was working on the problem at the absolute tip of the spear in terms of being in the US rather than in Africa. And I sat down ready to talk about and ask him what we can do in the big data world to help him. And he had boots behind him. And he said, I assume you're here to understand the protocol for suiting up and doffing your suit. I said, no, I'm not. He's like, okay, well, I assume then what you want to know is how many caregivers you need at minimum to take care of a, a patient, and I'm pretty sure the number is nine. What do you think? And that's when I knew I might be in the wrong, in the wrong place. <laughs> so from a signal detection perspective, just like from an IoT perspective, a lot of times the big data is not at the tip of the sensor. It's not in Brazil on Zika. But I will tell you that the folks that invent and develop the vaccine in Zika have been merging phenotype data with genomic data, and they've been using technology that allows them to only sequence five mice, not the 500 mice that they want. You, everyone in this room has access to genomic data. You all have friends. If you don't know where it is, I was on the phone. I don't know if I've even in this presentation said this. I was on the phone last night with this chief data officer of one of the largest five pharma companies on the planet. He said something, I'm paraphrasing, Sean, you told us that I wouldn't think that I had genomic data, and you, and you said to me, you have it. You don't know where it is yet, but you have it. He said, well, I just found out we funded a research scientist last summer, and I met with him last week, and he said he's created 600 terabytes of, of genomic data that, that we own. Are, do we have something for that? <laughs> I said, yes, <laughs> that's what this is. Um, signal detection. This is a case where the driving factor was we have many researchers and they all want to use their own tools. We have these young data miners. They call themselves data scientists. They use R and Python. They don't want to learn SAS. We have statisticians. They use SAS. Why would they use R or Stata, Stata? They, they don't want to use Python. They want to use SAS, and they're going to use SAS. We have applications that have code buried in them. We can't change at that level. What we want is we want a platform that is certified with the most recent version of all of these pieces that can be HIPAA secure. At the end of the day, half the customers that Cloudera has in health and life science, that's it. We're the easiest technology to secure at a HIPAA level that's up to date with all of these tools. SAS Institute, for example, has a Cloudera first policy, I was happy to find out. They test in, and will not test on any other big data platform until they have their most recent version of all products running on Cloudera properly. That was a bunch of epi folks. This is a clinical prediction. I'll tell you that Intel, if you didn't know this, spent close to a billion dollars to buy 18% of Cloudera shares. So they're important to us. They're a large shareholder. We partner very closely with them. At an executive level in Intel and Intel health professionals, their most important process is clinical prediction. We're working with them at Sharp Healthcare in Southern California right now to together build a predictive model that says where in our hospital, and I didn't realize we had um, in hospitals, they have rapid response teams. I assumed based on TV that any time this flashing goes on and someone starts to die, that whoever was closest to that patient could go over, get those paddles going, and just save them. Apparently, this is not how it's done that there are these rapid response teams who are seasoned professionals, there are crash carts, there are assets that are better than whoever is sort of standing around. And they said, we can save lives if we know where to put those folks. We want a risk score of every patient of who's going to crash so we don't have this asset in a different building. We can't get enough rapid response teams for our whole population, but if you tell us the 5% of the population, we can, we can do it. We can stick them right next door. Um, and Intel has a great data science group. I'll tell you that in this case, on this slide, this was um, congestive heart failure, I think was the driver of this and avoiding readmission. 
And the same thing, they said, we can't do care coordination that we need to do with these folks when they leave the building on the thousand we have at any given time across our many hospitals. But if you could tell us the 5% of folks that are very likely to come back, we could do the care coordination that we would like to do. Can you do that? And this again was an Intel Cloudera initiative and they went out and they looked at the electronic health records and they found some variables. They found some, with the open data, some demographic variables and they said, you know what? The distance from the residence of the patient that we are discharging to the location of our referral or where they think their follow-up appointment will be is one of the top three factors that decides if they're gonna show back up here as a, as a new admit. Uh, and you can see on the right some of the benefits I won't. It's the same model. The model is let's find the folks that are at risk and give them a higher level of care. It's like hot spotting in, in, in Newark. You know, if I know what the buildings are, I can bring the doctor to the building because those buildings cost me a million dollars each each year in healthcare. I want to say this is the last slide, um, or, or close to. This is, was another pharma. We have many use cases in health systems and in health plans. I think we have four of the top health plans as customers of Cloudera. In this case, they said, we'll force the users, you know, we're not as worried about what the users want to use as tools. What we want to do is we want to mash up, and my close colleague Steve Totman this morning talked about schema on read. This ability to say we're not going to model something. My friend Michael Lazar, who's in the federal group at Cloudera, who I hope you get a chance to meet, one of the smartest guys I think I've ever met, um, tells a story about, I want to say it was FEMA, and it may have been uh, the hurricane that was uh, the storms that were up in New Jersey. And they came to him and they said, you know, we like this idea of just putting data in whatever extension and file format and just putting it in here and letting the users and their knowledge of the data when they do the pulling out of insights, apply that logic. Um, and they said to Michael, how, how long do you think it takes if we find a new piece of data that we are fed by our local office? How long do you think it takes for us to build the data model and the extension for that and bring it in in the typical way, the schema on right? And uh, I don't know what his guess was. The answer was nine months. Nine months. So this is valuable to us. As fast as a pharma can license data sets of population, of claims data, of longitudinal data, they can put it in Cloudera. When they pay the price is when they say, okay, let's think about, is this social security field the same as it is over here? Um, and let's let the business people who know the data do that. Just very quickly, we have 77 health and life science customers today who we consider enterprise customers. They're split fairly evenly between health systems, health plans, pharma, biotech, and crop science, as well as data companies like Cerner um, and many others of that, of that ilk. Um, and then, very last slide, what I would hope that you get excited about and think about and talk to your friends about and read about when you see it in the paper, genomics is here. It's in your cereal, it's in your shampoo, it's in the, it's in crime, it's in traffic, it's in, you pick, pick a noun, I don't care what it is. Afterwards, when you see me in the crowd, pick a weird noun, and I bet you I'll be able to get a use case that's how we're, folks are using genomics in that space right now. It's here. As I said, precision medicine, Tomorrow, for our kids that are going to med school, it's just medicine. To them, precision medicine will be some further thing that we're not thinking about. Um, you know, my boss, uh, Amy O'Connor, kept saying in the beginning when I said, we're, we're going to call this asset Cloudera Omics. She said, why don't you just call it genomics? You know, what, what, why just omics? And I said, well, what about the microbiome? What about proteomics and metabolomics? I was at a conference a few months ago, and someone from Italy said, we want to create an omics that is the narrative of the patient journey. That doesn't sound like science. Can you really put omics on the end of that? Narrative omics. <laughs> so I don't know the omics that our kids will use, but it's there. Is the data big? I think you can see the statistics. It's the biggest of the big. 
I mean, I'm sure we'll invent something. We're going to Mars, so I don't want to say we're number one. But we're headed to be number one soon. And what I would like to say to you is, if security is important, if HIPAA compliance is supportive, if you want to do precision medicine with, with Baylor, with the Broad, with amazing pharma companies, and you want to do collaboration, this is the space we're investing in. This is the market we're saying is where we're at. We'll give you clinical prediction. We'll let you offload your Teradata, Netiza, and take a little bit of that data out of those systems to make those systems faster and so you can spend more money with those partners of ours on their best and most advanced software. We'll give you a sandbox. We won't turn those down, but what we're investing in and what we want is we want you to join us on this journey toward precision medicine because we're there. Um, that's it, thank you. I think we have five, five minutes if there are questions. Oh, hey, how are you? I got a question. I guess I've been doing a lot of SAS and Python programming. And everything I can do in SAS, I purposely put on my way to do it in Python. Yeah. Because if you can do it. What I saw with SAS, it takes a lot of human, it takes a lot of human intervention to go, to go off and understand the data. Within Python, I can easily call a function and get a return value and make a decision. Uh, you mentioned about the analytics on, on using SAS. Is, is people looking at uh, updating Python and to make sure you can do everything you can do in SAS? Could you? Yeah. So, so I would say my answer would be would be two parts. Um, first of all, thank you for being a data scientist. Uh, so I guess that's number one out of three. Um, the second would be if I see you in the, in, at the lunch or in the lobby, I'm going to put you with one of our data scientists if I could find one so you can talk yeah, uh, industry. Th this is w what I find. I was on the phone probably a year ago with a data scientist, and we were working on clinical text parsing, which is a use case we see a lot. It's not included in here. And I, and I said to, to this fellow, like, what are the algorithms? you use Python. No, what is the, not the language, what is the test, like the statistical test, Python? <laughs> I'm like, okay, the answer I'm looking for is not Python. Well, then I can't answer the question. <laughs> so wh what I see in the, in the field is um, there's federally mandated, maybe not quite federally mandated SAS, but there's a huge SAS community and they're gonna stay with that and there's a huge set of folks that, that like Python. Um, and I, we want to embrace everyone. But that being said, I think our data science group here um, would love to talk to you about what they see. Um, we want to make sure that whatever version of Python you use, whatever new standard within that world you use, we have the most supporters and the most committers at Cloudera, and we are embracing you and what we're doing. Um, that's one of the biggest benefits of my job is not having to say no to someone. So I'm sorry if that isn't helpful, but um, I guess yeah. one more thing, I also yeah. like to run machine learning on the data science. I also run machine learning, which I use Python to do. I'm not sure if SAS can do that, but this is why I use Python because I want to know like right now. I don't want to take yeah. five minutes offline and say, hey, look at the data and try to understand it. I take Python and take it to do yeah. it that way. Yeah. Keep it all one, one story. Well, it sounds like you have something that you like. Yeah. So rock on. <laughs> Sean, can I just, yeah. if you're into Python, um, Wiz McKinney, who wrote Pandas, actually works for Cloudera. And there's something called Impiler, which runs Python on Impala. So there's a whole bunch of projects we're doing around this. So yeah, we, we should definitely connect. Yeah, that's I think we have one minute. Hi, how are you? Oh, hi. Yeah, uh, also a data scientist, uh, I do population health and Medicaid data warehouses, so I was interested in that clinical use case uh, you had. I know that the largest Medicaid data warehouse in, in the country is not more than, than 50 terabytes, uh, and it would have been uh, relatively easy to do the calculation of, of distance uh, between patient and where their care was. Uh, but I also know that what wouldn't have been uh, in that data set and unlikely to be in an EMR because they usually don't ask 
is whether the patient had access uh, to transportation, uh, mm. and if not, how did they customarily get uh, to their medical appointments? Uh, so I, I guess I'm kind of asking you two questions. One is that, you know, there are people that, that do population health research, and I'm, I'm one of them, and I'm scratching my head a little for what I would do with genomic data if I had access to it. Uh, and secondly, I'm asking you to reflect on the fact that sometimes some of the most obvious pieces of information you want about access to care are things that are not customarily asked uh, by clinicians or government bureaucrats. And I wondered if you could reflect on that. Yeah. So um, I'd like 14 minutes to answer that. That was my joke. <laughs> but I have, I'll give you the one minute. Um, so on the, on the first part of the question, um, well, let me take the second part first. I think you and I should write a blog post, first of all. One of the things that, so IMS Health is a customer of ours. They do a lot with population health. Um, there are others that don't let us share their name. And what I would say is, um, as you probably know, this is amorphous. I go to health systems all the time. They say, well, this project is called population health. And when I find out what they're doing, I'm like, this is not population health. You know, you can, well, let's call it population health and make the space bigger. Um, what I want to do now is I want to make sure the information we have is captured. And a lot of that is in clinical notes. So this is a local-ish client of ours had a great story. And they said, why do we want to look through written notes that don't make it into the fields in an EHR that are in our claims data warehouse is because we will get a note like the following. And by the way, in our data warehouse, for every member, we know what they are on, what they're taking medication-wise right now. And in the note, we will see the following. Patient says she does not need a prescription for Lipitor. She gets all she needs from her sister. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know what you can do with that as a data scientist, but if you don't have it, <laughs> um, you, you want it. And so a lot of what we do is that. So first, I want to get that using NLP into your system. Second, let's change it. Let's you and I write a blog. Let's go out and tell the physicians these are the new things. Let's talk to Cerner and Epic. Let's get that in the record. Um, I don't have particular use cases um, where I can say, I'll trump your distance to clinician with you know, something else. But, but it's, let's do it. You and I, I'm being serious. Number two, one of our customers is Quintiles. I went down to them. I said, you guys have genomic data. You just don't know it. No, we don't. They came back two hours later at the end of the meeting. They said, we think we have these fields um, that we get, which are doctored ordered genomic tests, and we put them in these blank flex fields. So the column doesn't say genomics. I said, well, have you ever thought of doing a search on names of genes? Like, there are 40 genes that are involved in irritable bowel. You could put those in a query, and you could pick out which patients have a biomarker for irritable bowel. Oh. So I don't know, you know, there's not a lot of use in genomics that I see today in population health, and I think we're still working on low-hanging fruit. You would have to tell me. I see doing the natural language process as low-hanging fruit. Um, but when it gets to sophisticated models, it's out of my pay grade. Optum has a subsidiary that's a customer of ours. You know, let's get us hooked up and figure out what the best practice approach is. Does it seem pretty fragmented to you? Because it seems like a, there's a thousand points of light and people like you who are creating these models out there and there is no best practice. You'll buy that for right now. Okay, I'm keeping you from lunch. If you have questions, find me at lunch and let's applaud yourselves for being awake. <laughs>